So I just want them to just talk about who they are and what they do just for a minute. So you just have an awareness as well of other services that are available and other things to think about, and then we'll get into the formal Q&A session. Okay. 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 Um, I'm John Goddard, Supervising Solicitor for the Residential Advisory Service. Um, I guess the first thing, I just need to acknowledge that Sorting out these earthquake claims is a, is a long journey and it's taken its toll on the whole community. Um, I take my head off to Cancun for making this hub happen and for the speakers who have come to present tonight as well and acknowledge that there have been very real hardships and stresses which people in this room and others have had to bear in sorting these issues out. Um, Generally, the purpose of RAS is to unblock claims, earthquake claims that are stuck, whether they be with EQC or private insurers. And we have a team of solicitors who can provide independent advice through community law Canterbury. We also have a technical panel who can provide free technical advice relating to engineering and community surveying matters as well. But essentially, we encourage people to think about three things, which is, at the end of this process, where do you want to be? Second, how are you going to get there? And thirdly, what resources and support are you going to need along the way? And those are all critical questions which can be of huge assistance to people as they try to deal with this stuff. Thank you. Evening. Um, I'm Nikki Gosson, one of the managers from the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service, or CTAS in short. Uh, we run the matching and placement service for temporary accommodation for yourselves when you have to move out of your home, so we can support you with that and also manage the villages that the government put in place. Sorry. <laughs> um, we also administer the temporary accommodation allowance, which the government put in place for when your accommodation allowance ceases or you've expired through your insurance company when you've had to move out and pay an additional cost for your accommodation. The second hat I wear is Earthquake Support Coordination Service, and that is a, um, approximately 40 staff we have, Earthquake Support Coordinators, who can work alongside you to support you through the process and identify where you should go to get assistance. They can go with you to meetings, be a second pair of ears to what you're hearing, and just help you identify where are the places to go. So we have one of those here. My tip um, or purpose probably is to follow up from what Renee said, to make you aware that under the cash settlement process, if you are going to have to be out of your house for a period of time and you will expire your accommodation allowance with your insurance, it's really important to talk to our service before you sign up on the cash settlement to understand your eligibility to the government's assistance thereafter that expiring. So um, my name is Mark Rackley-Gow. Um, I lead a team at BNZ called Future Hub. Uh, we were set up almost two years ago now just to um, assist people that were impacted by the earthquakes and look for ways to move forward uh, in a post-quake environment. Um, and I think the key point um, from our perspective, uh, as Renee said, if you have a mortgage over your property, um, the bank will be involved in the cash settlement process. Um, so make sure that you actually include your bank before making any final decision. That way the bank can actually help you confirm what options are available from their perspective. Um, and uh, as Duncan said, you know, one of the key things is to actually shape the conversation. Um, it's better to do this earlier rather than later. Thank you, I'm Samson Samasoni from the Insurance Council. IAG and other insurers involved in the Canterbury Rebuild are members of the Insurance Council, so I know if any of you are IAG customers, you'll 
talk to Rene afterwards, but if you're not, you may want to have a quick word to us and then we can just refer you on to your insurer. We can't deal with specific claims, but we can pass it on and obviously we have an interest in the whole rebuild and um, how it's progressing. Just two quick points I want to make uh, while I've got the opportunity. Uh, in terms of cash settlement, this isn't a new thing. So some media may have you believe that it's something that's been imposed on you right now. That's not the fact. Insurers have been cash settling. It's always been an option right from the start. And of the 15,000 over cap claimants who have gone through the process, if we take away the red zone properties, over half of those have successfully cash settled and moved on with their lives. So it's an option that's available for you and it's good you've been able to hear a bit more about it today. And as I say, don't rely on media for your advice about these things. There are very good services available to give you independent information. And this is the last point I really want to emphasize. We have the resident, uh, Residential Advisory Service, RAS as we call it, who provide free, independent advice, qualified lawyers who are there to sit with you, sometimes across the table with the insurer on the other side, to help you understand what yeah, you're able to get in terms of your policy and to be able to facilitate a resolution for you. Because I think we'd all agree that uh, what we want to be able to do is move forward and be able to get on with our lives. So I just thought, quick exercise, how many of you have heard of RAS? If you can put up your hands. How many of you have used the service? Okay, so it's there, it's free. I'm not saying that Duncan's not good, but <laughs> he'll charge you. <laughs> Whereas there's a free independent service with proper legal advisors and a technical hub so they can go through the technical issues with you and it won't cost you anything. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's move to uh, the question and answer. So the way we uh, ran this this afternoon is uh, a bit at a time. So everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question if they want to. Now, if you're not the type of person who feels comfortable about talking, please make sure that you do write your questions down and hand them in before you leave, because we will be collecting those, along with all the questions that are asked, and we will be putting the answers up online. So if you don't feel comfortable asking a question here, please still get a question to us if you have one. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, can we have questions which are a little bit, which are going to affect more than just yourself? If it's too specific about your your claim or your particular property, it may be too hard for the panel to answer. So a question which you know it's going to be, everyone wants to hear the answer to that particular question if you'd be thinking about that. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to start at the back, we're going to go through a line at a time and just come to the front, all right, as, as we work through. Last thing is, you can just choose one question, okay? All right, I know you've all got a million, because I've got two million. Because I've been here for the last couple of weeks and it's an amazing question. Very good, but just for tonight, so that we can all feel like uh, we've had a go. Just one question, and we'll put it to the panel, and with a bit of luck, we will come through the room uh, in the next half hour. Okay? So, Jason, we'll, be st we'll start at the back, and we'll come to the front. Jason. Yes, ma'am. Rene started her talk with saying, if you are thinking of accepting a cash settlement, I didn't think we had a choice now. Certainly what was in, implied to me. So it will depend on your circumstances and your insurer, but with most insurance companies you do have a choice, and so it is about that negotiation and discussing with your insurer what your options are. With all programs, there will always be a reinstatement program for vulnerable customers as well. So that was one of the things that I should have mentioned, is all insurers will manage rebuilds for some customers and repairs. It's more about what's the best option going to be for you and discussing that with your insurer. Just say that um, you said we had to put a case when, when I talk to the insurance if I need to. I, I don't want to do a rebuild with the money myself. I, I'm just not wanting to. And they said, well, you've got to put a case. Well, how do you do that? So let me pick that specific one up with you afterwards because it sounds like it's quite specific to you and I might be able to help you with that. That was one of the things that I was just going to add from Brian is if um, your question is really specific, we will be here afterwards, so don't feel like you'll go away without the question answered. It will just be that we'll do it directly with you. Thanks. I'll just make a brief comment. Firstly, I'll say um, there's a help sheet that I hand out or give away 
here. Um, so it, it's got a, just a few bullet points, some of which I touched on, some of which I didn't. So do feel free to take one away with you and read it at, at your leisure. In terms of that question, can an insurer force me to cash settle? Uh, there's, there's kind of two answers to that. One is, um, in terms of can they force me to take this as a full and final payment, the answer is very clearly no. They can't. And, and, any, and look, we need to remember that like any organisation, there's diff different levels of skill within insurance companies, and some claims managers don't understand all of the subtleties themselves, and they make mistakes about what they communicate to us. So it is important that we get advice and we understand those kinds of things. So the short answer is no, they can't fully and finally cash settle you. Can they insist that you take cash instead of them managing the rebuild? Yes, they can. But then it means that you can uh, just go back to them and get whatever money it takes. That's generally unattractive to the insurers and they don't like it. Um, we've got to remember that no insurer, every insurer is entitled to talk to you about outside of your strict policy entitlement arrangements. And managing a rebuild um, it may fall within that sort of out of policy entitlement. So again, it's part of that. Uh, it's part of that negotiation. If you do, if the insurer does insist on a cash settlement, don't think you have to manage it yourself. Go and get a project manager. Insurance companies don't build houses. Project managers manage it. Builders build it. So don't think you're going to be overwhelmed. You're fully entitled to be paid for someone else to manage that process for you. So I think the important part of that is building a case. How do you build a case? So maybe John might help. <coughs> well, I'd just like to say that since IAG made their announcement about how most cases will now be um, cash settled, RAS and IG have figured out a process for dealing with those sorts of issues. And the things that we're looking at is whether or not an insurer has said or stated unequivocally that they will do a repair or rebuild. We also look at how far down the process a particular set of repairs or rebuilding is, and also um, vulnerability criteria around the people who will be directly affected by that decision. So those are the things that are relevant to take into consideration. Thanks. Um, I just had a question about vulnerability for um, Renee, like what defines vulnerability? It's specifically actually an 85 year old woman on her own, would that be classified as vulnerable? And if she has her own preferred builder? No, so we're very careful to not classify vulnerability and we've actually been talking to Cancern about the fact that it's probably more ability or inability to manage rather than vulnerability. And the reason for that is we have used age and health and those things as criteria before, but we had an example of a 91-year-old customer last week who said, yes, cash settlement is the best option for me because then I move into a retirement village and I do different things. So it's not just about age and that's where it is a conversation so every cash settlement starts with that conversation around what is your ability to manage this yourself and as Duncan said it's not always managing it yourself there may be other people that can help so it is age is one of the elements we look at but it's not the only one so we wouldn't say she's 85 she's vulnerable all right so the thing about ability I mean if you are feeling unable to do it that's the argument they're going to put in so you could be young, but you're just really tired and your head is just like way past being able to process things properly. You are unable to. You need help to do that. This is the argument that Cancern is putting forth in terms of vulnerability and moving away from that word and into are you able or not. And so we move away from age, but certainly age does come into it. Sorry. Thanks. Just from uh, other insurers' perspective, the, there is a, vulner, a general vulnerability criteria that people use, uh, that insurers use, and some of it is to do with age, financial hardship, uh, health issues, and so on. And then some of the health issues might be stress factors or, or other things that are impacting people's ability to, uh, to progress with their claim. So insurers treat it slightly different. Some have a, a very clear vulnerability criteria they use, Others, it's a, a bit more uh, flexible in the way it uh, interprets it, but it is about your ability to be able to progress the claim and reach resolution. Um, 
I'm not sure about the um, word early consultation that's being used. I don't want to prejudice my situation. I've got a new case manager from my insurance company who's identified a series of tests that still haven't been taken on my house. For the first time, he's used the words, we have to do these tests to know whether your house is a repair or a rebuild. Do I put my hand up at this stage and say, in fact, I want to be cash settled? I, I'm too old, too sick of it, too sick of the house, too sick of everything. Just sit and go through a repair. Um, can't even rebuild on the property I've got because it's too close to the creek. I'd lose about a third of the land area. Um, it's just so confusing and I just don't know when I do what. I know what I want in the long term. Um, I can't go through a repair or a rebuild. But if I discuss that at this stage, will the insurance company say, oh, well, we'll cash set that on the cheap? And um, I've looked all. I mean, I had discussed it ages ago, and they said, "Oh, they'd give me sixty thousand, and it's more like four hundred. I need at least." So I would, my um, recommendation would be to have honest conversations right from the very beginning. So if you know that that's what you're looking at, then that would help your case manager to work with you. But it won't mean that they will cash settle without doing the relevant test. They might say to you, what do you intend to do? Because there might be some things that they could include in a cash settlement that they wouldn't if they've already incurred the cost. So for example, if you need a geotech assessment and they haven't done it, they might be able to say, well, we'll include $10,000 or $15,000 for that geotechnical assessment in your cash settlement and we'll give you an estimated cost of foundations. Um, so I would have the conversation now because then that will help you to build up that cash settlement offer. In a situation like that, it does sound like you do need some advice. I would certainly go and take some advice. Um, and it's not always just advice of, of, of strict legal uh, issues. It's, it's just advice about what to do next um, and, and what's the best way. You've got to remember, it's also about generating options. It's not linear. Uh, it's, it's not just aiming towards a cash settlement. It's saying, okay, we've got a cash settlement option over here. What's my next, what's my other option and which, which is preferable? And if you're a repair and you're by the river and, and, and so on, it may well be that the better option is to decline any cash settlement uh, and make sure your house is repaired properly. Uh, if it's a rebuild, things might change. Uh, but just remember, it's, it's, it's not about just having one option, it's about measuring options against each other. And there is almost always more than one option. A lot of the advice you're giving is between the client and the insurance company tonight. Do the same principles apply when you're dealing with EQC? I don't think anyone from EQC is here. Um, but uh, look, the, the same principles apply in the sense that you do have a kind of insurance policy with EQC, it's called the EQ, Earthquake Commission Act, and all of your rights and the EQC's obligations are set out in that act. EQC does behave somewhat differently from insurance companies. Um, look, I'll be honest, they're much more difficult to deal with, um, and, and that's, that can be saying something sometimes. Um, but the, the fact, one of the things that, that, that EQC generally doesn't do is they, they never close the book. So if you uh, find further damage, you can go back and say, look, there's further damage. If they say, here's a check to repair it, you go and repair it and it costs more, you can go back and say, I need some more money. This but is after, a, after a cash settlement. Yes, after a cash settlement. Yeah. So yeah, I would if you are given a cash settlement by EQC and you're concerned it's not enough, I would just record that by uh, writing everything should be in writing, writing back to them and saying, Well I'm gonna do those repairs, but I'm concerned and I will come back to you for more if I need to. Um, so uh, but yes the principles are the same. Just moving over to the other side. Questions? No? Okay. Just going to Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to ask about with the cash settlements, when they're, you've got your scope of works and they're sorting out the payments, um, are they going by the general dollar signs or are they going by the dollar signs that are uh, negotiated with the insurance companies with builders? I mean, over the 
rebuild, I know there's been a lot of contracts with various builders with the insurance companies, which is a lot cheaper than what I would pay if I go and do it myself. So how's that being organised? So I can speak on behalf of IAG, but it should be consistent across the insurers. Is it's at full replacement cost now. So as Samson mentioned, insurers have always been cash settling, but to begin with, a lot of those cash settlements were at indemnity value because that's what the policy entitlement was. It's now at replacement value, and the principle of insurance is you have to be able to replace it at the cost that we settle. So if you had concern about the builder's cost, that might be someone else that you'd go to for advice. So if you had a builder that you were going to use yourself, you'd take our costs and say to your builder, can you build it for this? And if he says no, then that's where you would start your negotiation with your insurer. And um, it's really can be quite useful to um, engage your own quantity surveyor so you have an independent assessment of the cost, which is one way of getting around that problem. Another way, as Renee says, is if you have a preferred builder, say, well, um, this is the work that needs to be done, how much is it going to cost for you to do it? And that's another way of controlling the cost. Um, and that's part of a bigger thing, which with cash settlement is risk management. And so it's good to have strategies to be able to limit and manage your risk. Hi there. Um, if the Geotech uh, recommends TC3 foundations, um, then does the cash settlement cover this? Yes, if you intend to reinstate those TC3 foundations. So if you said to your insurance company, I'm not going to reinstate on this site, I'm going to go and build on TC1 or I'm going to go and buy an existing home, then no, it wouldn't. So it's about what it's going to cost you to reinstate. So you'd have, the, have to have the intentions of replacing those foundations and they'd have to be damaged. Yeah, they're damaged and also there's a fair liquefaction under, under the foundations. Yeah, so that's so. probably land damage, which is covered by EQC. So there may be a land damage um, claim still outstanding as well. Yeah. If there's an increased risk of liquefaction, if there was always a risk, then there may, may not be. I'd just like to add briefly to that that some insurance companies with enhanced foundation costs won't insist on a full and final settlement so that the claim costs for enhanced foundations remain open. So if they end up costing more than the cash settlement, some, some insurers say you can come back to us for those costs. So again, that would come down to the negotiation. So if you were concerned about your foundations, and some people will say, yes, we are concerned, we want to leave that element open, then you would discuss that in your negotiation. And what would generally happen is you would either have contingencies included in a in cash settlement and you'd sign a full and final because those contingencies are for those unexpected costs, or you would have the contingencies taken out and that element left open. So you'd sign a partial discharge, so you might say, We'll sign the discharge for everything above ground, but actually we want a partial discharge so that we can leave the foundation at one and open. So you would you would discuss that with your settlement specialist at the time of settlement. So if there's been a proposal um, to repair a, a badly damaged slab by filling it and et cetera, et cetera, should that be rejected? Uh, we can't probably, because we're not structural engineers, I don't know if we can comment on that. That is an engineering question. Uh, and, and the, the right person to ask that is an engineer, but you also need to recognise that engineers will disagree themselves. Um, now, the fact of if every repair must comply with build, appropriate building standards, building code, and the Building Act, um, and so we need that, that's the that's the baseline. The next thing to think about in a question of your nature is what is your policy entitlement? Now, most policies that were enforced at the time use words like as new or when new. Now, yeah. some repairs will put a house, and, and I'm not a, um, no, my view is that some repairs of foundations will put them back in a state in which they are as strong as they were, as durable as they were, as functional as they were, and look as good as they were when they're new. And if they do that, it's hard to fault them. But it's really important to note that that's not always the case. So grout injection and epoxy crack filling sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't. There is no single answer to that question. It's a matter for engineering advice. Okay. 
I'm not sure if you're insured with IAG, but if you are, if anyone is concerned about engineering um, recommendations, then we have a panel of engineers. So what we can do is get an engineer to sit down with you and talk you through any repair methodology. And we don't have to be a party to that conversation, but we can we can set you up a meeting with an engineer to talk you through it. So see me afterwards and we can organise that. Thanks. So just to be mindful of time, so just one, just your, your, your top question, thanks. Yeah. Deed of assignment, if you're handling, if you, if, which is what I'm facing, um, where it appears the insurance company has contracted out of certain of the original obligations of the policy, um, i.e. Uh, loss of rent while the repairs are carried out, um, the fact that you've got a denity value rather than replacement value, and so on. So. Um, and in terms of accepting the settlement the insurance company is offering uh, and conducting the repairs and getting reinsurance, it, obviously there's a, there's, a, there's a difference there. Uh, I'm just interested in, in the panel's comments on that. Okay, so just to clarify, I think what you're talking about is a deed of assignment of the rights to the insurance claim when you purchase a house after the earthquakes. Yeah. Um, and there are some insurance companies which... Uh, insisted that before they would acknowledge your entitlement, you sign a document about that assignment. Um, my view is quite firm on this, uh, and that is that there was no requirement to sign that document. If I'm selling you my house, it's my insurance claim, the insurer doesn't have to agree to it. So there is a question mark over the legitimacy of the document that you signed in, with the insurance company. Uh, because you, they gave nothing for it and you gave a whole lot away uh, for it. So there is a real question mark over those. Uh, in terms of, in, in norm, there is a question about when you take over a claim, you've paid money for a house, um, and the, the question is whether or not you're entitled to, in fact, more than you paid by dint of purchasing the insurance rights. The basic principle is this, it's called the indemnity principle, and it's that insurance um, should put the person back in the position that they were at the time of the loss. If you didn't own the house at the time of the loss, there is an argument that your, your, your loss is purely financial, and therefore you're entitled only to what's now called indemnity value. There is arguments that go the other way, and quite persuasive arguments, which are simply that you get all of the entitlements that the previous owner of the house had. So you've asked a really legally complex question. In terms of the document that you signed about the assignment, which isn't an assignment document, but about the assignment with the insurer, there are, there are legitimate, in my view, this is a legal view, insurers don't like it, there are legitimate, real legitimacy questions around it. Thank you. I'd just add to that that your question raises technical legal issues and is something which needs to be negotiated with insurers. And so the first step would be to get some really good legal advice on the way to progress those sorts of issues. Thanks, and maybe you want to talk to me afterwards. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, if an insurance company pulls the pin on an assigned building company two weeks before a demolition and gives you two weeks to make a decision on whether you're going to take a cash settlement or um, a rebuild, can you take or negotiate more time to make this decision without them taking an offer off the table? The, well, the basic answer to that question is this. An insurer, whatever they do, have to act reasonably and fairly and take your interests into account as well as their own. Um, and I'm yet to see an insurer, and I've seen those letters, um, and I have an almost standard response, which is, it's going to take us longer than that to advise our clients and tell them how long we need. I've never yet had an insurer say, I'm sorry, but uh, the deadline is, 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 is set in stone. Uh, they know, uh, as well as anyone, that they can't really impose deadlines, and I do find uh, those letters and those deadlines a little um, 
unfortunate, to put it, uh, put it lightly. Um, in terms of those questions about if I'm halfway through and the building contract's about to be signed, there's a really important question in there. Because uh, insurance companies, most policies give insurance companies choices. The choice whether to rebuild or the choice whether to pay cash. If they have gone down the line and they've organised builders, it's highly likely the insurance company has actually made the choice to enter into the building contract and manage the rebuild or repair, whatever it might be. And you're not allowed, an insurance company is not allowed to unmake that choice. They can agree with you to, to backpedal, but at one point that choice becomes irrevocable when they've clearly made an election as to how they will settle the claim. So, you know, that's really important to bear in mind as well. I'll just add on that, again, make sure you're having a conversation with your insurer because, as Duncan mentioned, a lot of those um, deadlines are a bit arbitrary and some of those are because, I was saying to someone earlier, I know myself as a customer, I'm too busy to make a decision on how I'm going to settle my insurance claim. So we've put some things in place to try and help people make those decisions by putting timeframes in place, but have that conversation because some of those settlements where you are already engaged with the builder will be the easiest ones because the only difference would be if you were working with us with Orange Homes and you liked Orange Homes and you met the project manager and you were happy with them, the only difference is you never give your insurer your EQC money, you keep it in your bank, we pay you the money and you manage the milestone payments to the builder. So you could keep that um, relationship going, but you would just need some time to work through how that works for you. So I would just be having a conversation with your insurer and saying, hang on, I need to think about these options and it's going to take me longer than two weeks to speak to my accountant, my bank, to work out how I would manage those payments and all of those things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, do you have, does uh, the bank have anything to say about that? So, um, as Renee said, um, where she said uh, you get to manage the payments to your builder um, if the bank's involved in terms of needing to, um, uh, to re-access borrowing, um, then the bank will actually be involved in managing the, the process and the payments with the builder. So, um, so it's just an important distinction that there is still a process to go through with your bank. Um, it's not quite as simple and clear cut as you may think. We're on to the middle road. Yes, ma'am. My question is about um, contingency amounts and discharge forms. I have the lovely position of having two cash settlements with two different insurance companies on the same property in the family unit. So, some response in IAJ, but the prisoners end with both. IAJ have come back now because we were concerned about foundations, because we're TC3, and basically said that contingency allowance of 20%. But then you said we could um, take that out and put a discharge form, but I wasn't sure what the discharge form meant. So that was where my question came in, because if the foundation's going to cost more, does that mean that basically you're going to pay for the money to pay for the foundation? Yeah. So that was what I was mentioning earlier. It yeah. would be one or the other. So yeah, they, yeah. you would either say, okay, well, I'm happy to take the 20% contingency and I'll sign a full and final discharge. So then if you do reinstate and it costs you more, you've taken that risk on. Or you take the 20% contingency out and you sign a partial discharge. So then if there's extra costs involved with the foundations, we pay the extra cost. I've managed that with IAJ. I've just got some response to work on it. Um, with the recent uh, movement of the goalposts by IAG, putting an, an overwhelming emphasis on cash settlement, in regard to some of the more complicated repairs, like for instance, combination of repair and rebuild, for example, moving the house to the rear of a section, pouring a new foundation and then moving the house back on top of it, are we going to see in the next few weeks a lot of these classified combinations or even repairs are going to be reclassified as rebuilds and therefore the person gets less money? The short answer I think would be no. So you're saying if it was a repair, would it then become a rebuild? Yeah. Is the state going to reclassify a lot of these more complicated repairs or combinations of rebuilds and repairs as rebuilds? No, that's not our intention. What we will always look at is at the point of cash settling, 
is that still the most economic option? So whether it's a repair or a rebuild. And in some instances, the um, houses that were going to be repaired become rebuilds and then the negotiation, so it's a repair of $300,000, it's a rebuild of $350,000, and then the rebuild cost gets skyrocketed up by different reports and things and becomes $800,000. Well, then it's back to a $300,000 repair. So we're not going to go around and reclassify a whole lot of things, but we will always look at is that the most economic option at the time of settling, which comes back to that point that a cash settlement is about what we know at the time of settling. So if you have concerns, you'd want to be raising those before you settle. Thank you. Okay. I'd like, I would like to know who is financing RAS. RAS is funded by EQC, the Insurance Council and the Earthquake Recovery Authority and the Insurance Council seeks contributions from insurers who are contributing to the scheme. I have nothing to do with RAS um, and I, I just, in terms of the tenor of that question, um, it, is, um, it is funded through in insurers um, but it's managed by entirely independent lawyers and I have nothing the highest respect for the work that they guys do. I would just add to that because we do work with them but they question us. So it is an independent service and although it's funded by insurers, we only fund it because we see that it does fulfil a really important role in the community in that it gives people access to independent free advice but completely independent. I think that is the important part to stress is the independence. Everyone's going to have an opinion on this. This is a good question. Just, just very quickly, because I sit on the governance board for the Residential Advisory Service on behalf of the Insurance Council, I can categorically say we have no involvement in the day-to-day -day operations of it. All we're making sure is there's sufficient funding uh, and uh, administrative process to make sure the money is going uh, in there to support what these highly qualified independent lawyers need in order to provide uh, independent advice to you. The point to stress and something that often gets missed is that neither insurers nor EQC deliver RAS. RAS is delivered, the legal side of it is delivered by Community Law Canterbury who have provided independent legal services for people to meet unmet legal need in Christchurch for the last 40 years. Our team currently consists of myself, 10 solicitors who are trained in all the practicing certificates, one law clerk, one researcher, one administrator and five interns. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. They turn into a big question. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering. Yes. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> you say uh, we have a choice with cash settlements. The IAG actually came to us and told us we didn't have a choice. They told us we were starting to go through the repair program, and we got to getting your scope of works and all that. And we'd sign to say that, you know, IAG will do our repairs. And next thing we get a phone call to say that, you know, be cash settled. And we said we didn't want to, but they've told us that we have no choice because we have not signed with the builder. Well, there's, two, there's two things to say about that. Firstly, and it's probably not all that useful, is to say there's an argument that four years on, at the time to cash settle for insurance companies was in the first you know, period, whatever that might be, and we're certainly not in the first period now. But in terms of choice, um, as I've said before, the the insurer does have a choice, does have a right to insist on cash settlements, but not full and final cash settlements. So if they, if, if IAG says to you, we insist on cash settling, so I'd like to have a meeting, bring the policy, tell me what my rights are under the policy. And it doesn't anywhere in the policy say, if we pay cash, we can determine what the figure is and make it full and final. What it says is, we will pay you the cost of rebuilding or repairing your home. It means that the management of that task goes over to you. And IAG or Southern Response or whomever it might be doesn't have a right to manage it. You have an obligation to make sure that you re rebuild or repair only in accordance with the policy, but the insurer still has to pay whatever it costs. 
Now, that's un to be honest, to be perfectly honest, that's unattractive for everyone because it means you've got an ongoing relationship with the, the insurer in which there will be tension because the insurer will be nervous about the amount of money, their money, that you're spending. Uh, that's why insurers want to fall in, to cash, make cash settlements full and final. It's perfectly sensible, but it's not something that they can absolutely insist on. I'm very clear about that, I hope. Oh, okay, no, well, they, we have had a meeting with some of my agent in the cash settlements, and we asked about that, and we were told, no, we had no choice. Can I speak to you afterwards, because I think it sounds like our communication hasn't been great, and I apologise for that, okay. I find it frustrating, um, but there's a whole lot of different ways that cash settlements can be managed as well, and one of them is if you've already engaged with a builder, with us, then it's a hand-holding process from us to the builder, but we still keep some level of involvement. So there's a few different ways that we can manage things, but let's just follow up on your individual claim afterwards. Hi, um, I'm actually a body corp secretary for a multi-unit dwelling. Um, we haven't actually managed to move out of EQC's umbrella at the moment. We're still under the capable hands of the RAS team. Um, what I'm actually looking for is, are there any other support options for those of us that have these multi-unit claims, other than the RAS team, in and about Christchurch? Yeah, yeah. Well, support and advice on, on where we should go, what other options we've got. So there so, is so yeah, there is a range of support services, of yeah. one, which is based support coordination services one. Um, that can help you. Sorry, um, can help you through that process. It's about supporting you, not doing it necessarily for you and taking over, but actually supporting you to achieve what it is you're wanting. And we would use the likes of RAS. We might recommend that you don't need to see a lawyer, but along the way we would help you identify who it is and what you need. But we'd also support you along your own well, the well-being of the people that are involved as well. So it might be about other things that are happening for yeah. people as well, and it might just be too much to do the insurance, the repair, rebuild portion of your lot within your life because you've got so many other things going on as well. So we can actually help with that process. So we're one of probably a couple of agencies around that will do that. But we, if we're not the right place, we would certainly help you link to where it is. So Jill's here and I'll be here afterwards and okay. we can have a chat about that. Yeah, that would yep. be great. But I mean, the RAS team have been amazing, yeah. to be honest. And we work quite Fantastic. closely together around yeah. that support and use the advice. <laughs> so there's a difference between advice services and support services. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say on that, that <clears throat> for lawyers generally, multi-unit dwellings are hugely complex and present a whole number of challenges. But fundamentally, um, <clears throat> we cannot act for more than one client if it's possible that their interests are going to be in conflict because that would be a breach of our professional rules. And so that makes us have to be quite careful in the way that we deal with multi-unit dwellings. The second thing is that with body corporates generally, some are really well organised and easy to deal with and have good governance structures, whereas others don't. And the legislation around that, and the rules around that, can be quite complex. And so it's really important to get good advice to people to make sure that things are done properly. And that will have a passion for dealing with insurers and also with banks as well. Uh, is it correct that uh, cash settlement should include, as a minimum, 10% loading for contingencies, plus 10% loading for professional fees, and in the case of a rebuild, demolition costs? I noticed earlier when I referred to a 20% contingency, but um, that may be encompassing what I thought. So that was just that specific example, and it will vary depending on your negotiation. So it's about what's important to you, what's going to be reason reasonably incurred, and about your policy wording. So some policy wordings will say it includes legal fees and professional fees that are reasonably incurred. Others may not. So it is about your individual policy and your situation, and the contingencies allowed will differ. Because if it's a very complex hill site, for example, that's got eight levels built into a hill, there'll be more contingencies than a simple flat um, group home build. So it is really about the individual case. Yeah. 
there's no 10%, 20%. It will depend on the property. Would you agree on the 10% minimum? Well, no, because if it's just a very simple and there's a fixed price from the builder, you might say there's no contingencies. It really does depend on what the negotiation is. Duncan probably realises I'm referring to a certain court appeal code. Oh, yeah, well, it's currently on appeal, of course. Uh, Openside Holdings still to get leave to go to the Supreme Court. But um, the answer to your question is, that is again, um, it's not for me or arguably Renee to answer. It's a quantity survey question. Um, because as Renee said, it will depend on e e every case is different. Um, and there will be some simple builds where the, contin where the con contingency is about project risk. Um, and there will be situations where the risk is small and others where it's high. Um, and the evidence in the Avonside Holding case was basically that it was between 8 and 12% contingency and the judge just picked the middle number. Uh, so there was not a great deal of science in that particular 10% figure. So don't, don't place too much weight on that. But certainly if you're cash settling um, and, it's, and you're going to undertake the project, it is reasonable to expect a contingency to be included. But exactly what that is depends very much on the nature of the project. On the site? Yes. Um, I just have a question around the MBIE guidelines. Um, in a replacement um, policy, uh, it says that the uh, rebuild must comply with government regulations, etc. And the MBIE guidelines came out, I think, during 2011. Duncan, in your experience, has the MBIE guidelines sort of discounted the value of a cash payout, or do they apply as a, as a regulation in law? Um, well, the, the, there's a, another recent case, Medical Assurance in the East, or Eastern Medical Assurance, looked at the relevance of building standards um, and I think, by analogy, MBA guidelines as well, and said, look, they are relevant. But you've got to remember what they're relevant to. The, the, the question that they are relevant to is, is this remedial solution one which is, meets appropriate building standards? Um, and th those guidelines are updated all the time, and um, one of the frustrations for homeowners has been that uh, their, their, their own repair or rebuild solution has changed as the guidelines have changed what might be considered to be um, acceptable. You've got to remember what they aren't. The MBA guidelines and the building code and building standards are not the insurance policy. So you need to go back to the insurance policy. Because, what, for example, if you had a brand new house uh, that was by definition within new build tolerances, floor levels leapt to mind, um, and after the earthquake it's out of uh, new build tolerances, there's no suggestion that there's any pre-existing damage there. Um, the MBIE guidelines, if we just followed those, would not return it to new build tolerances. But your entitlement under the policy is certainly to have it put back in the same you know, uh, shape, functionality, aesthetic, and so on uh, as new build. Now, sometimes the compliance with the MBIE guidelines will be satisfactory, but sometimes they won't meet policy standards. And the MBIE guidelines themselves, in their introduction, say they are not intended as a guide to policy, uh, satisfying policy entitlements. Just a, a quick one on the uh, MB guidelines. I mean, it, it's true, the policy issues aside, they are changing all the time. And this week they introduced uh, four, I think, new uh, land repair methodologies. What that means is that obviously the TC3, they've got these other guidelines that they say would be applicable repair, land repair options, and it could also then mean that your foundation requirement will change. And then some customers complain, well, our insurer's trying to do it on the cheap then. It's not necessarily so, it's because these guidelines are changing, then the repair um, solutions, foundation solutions might also change because they keep updating these things. So it's just useful to be mindful of that, these sorts of updates. Front row. I've got so many questions, so I don't know which one to put. Um, sure. <laughs> um, have, we, have we seen any cases of where you might want to, um, well, you, you're forced to cash settle, um, but you want to sign with the um, like your foundation work protected, where the insurer just won't let you go ahead and progress your bill because you won't sign? 
So you held up, again, held up by IG or whatever. Because really they've got all power. And, um, well, no, they haven't. Um, I mean, I, I, accept, I accept there is an imbalance of power there. But the, the answer to your question is go back to the policy. Because uh, most of the discussions that I had with insurers don't comply, don't follow strictly policy entitlements. And that's fine. That's really fine as long as it's working for everyone. But if you're unhappy with what is being uh, offered to you by the insurer and it's not within the four corners of the policy, go back to the policy and say, well, look, under the policy, you have these choices. Fix it or pay me to fix it, whatever it costs. Now, then the insurer has a very clear choice. M one of the frustrations that I have is that when you point that, that out to an insurer, they prefer not to answer the question. But that's really where the power lies in your hands, is to say it's a contract. And if you're not getting a response, look, you, you can either go to someone like a lawyer or to RAS or something like that, or you can go and get the assistance of the insurance ombudsman. Now, the insurance ombudsman is a very useful scheme where if, the, if you're not happy with the way your insurer is managing something, it doesn't have to be about money, it can be just about the management, you can go to the insurance ombudsman and say, we've reached a deadlock, We've got, not, we've got an impasse, we need to know what's right and wrong. And the insurance ombudsman will usually give good guidance as to what the next step is. Quite often, just indicating that you know what your entitlements are and you know what, that you can go to the ombudsman will be enough for someone else within the insurance company to have a look at it and make a bit of a breakthrough. That's the only other thing that I would add, and I think Duncan touched on it before. With all the best of the intentions in the world, sometimes it is about getting the right person within the organisation. So all insurers have our own complaints process as well, and generally it is it goes from the person who's handling your claim to their manager, to their manager, to our CEO. So there's a six-step process, and we wouldn't want you to have to get to the point where you're litigating. We should be having the right conversations with you. So in your particular case, speak to me, because I can probably get you some progress on that but stuff. Yeah, because the claims handler tells you the bad news that you're going to get the cash settled, um, and then they say you can't have a debate about that till all the figures are in, which is not going to be September. So I'm waiting another one till yeah. September just to have the argument. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's too long to sit in limbo, so speak to me and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. And I can probably answer your other questions as well, so you won't go away without an answer, we'll make sure we... Hi, um, we're with EQC currently, um, but we've just had an independent um, engineer's report uh, which indicates we're over cap, uh, quite possibly uneconomic to repair. Uh, so I'd like to know what IAG's responsibilities are for assessment to help us get uh, over cap where we should be, because I rang them two years ago and they said basically we don't want to know about you until EQC get in touch. So what we would do, and I'd say it would be the same for any insurer, is we would look at the reports that you have. So if you forward a copy of the report that you have, then we would look at that. We would also speak to EQC and see why there is a difference between their report and yours. And if the damage, if we believe that your report shows damage that they haven't captured, or if it is close to cap, then we would come and do our own assessment. And if we believe it's over cap, then we would request a joint review with EQC. So we can take control of it, but we would have to see some kind of um, report, and any insurer would say this, that indicates that it will be over cap, because um, the cost of assessment for a full assessment is around $20,000, so we do want to have some kind of um, indication that we are going to be able to help you get to a different outcome than if we weren't involved. All right, just a quick comment on this. If you are uh, with EQC at the moment and you believe you're over uh, cap, uh, the insurance industry desperately wants to know how many claims are going to go over cap. So we'd really encourage you to, uh, you know, let your insurer know that this is where you're at. Let the EQC know that, uh, you know, you're moving this forward because uh, insurers, uh, you know, four years on, we're still getting claims now. We'd rather know about all the potential over cap now rather than later. And for some of us, I mean, you may have heard in the news that Tower stopped trading for a couple of days uh, because they were unclear about their uh, Canterbury earthquake liabilities. Now that's really, that's how serious it's starting to get for insurers when we have to start thinking about these issues and we really want to get a handle on how many EQC claims are currently in dispute that potentially could go over cap. So I'd encourage you to really uh, take your cases forward.
Uh, my house is a rebuild, and uh, I don't intend rebuilding. I'm currently working with my insurance company, and I'm exploring two options a cash settlement or buying a square. And they've offered me two figures one for buying a square, which I presume is some of the new value that I've been facing my house. Yeah. And the other cash settlement is 50 grand below. Is that normal practice to offer you? Uh, that sounds a little bit like a southern response policy. Um, <laughs> and the answer probably lies, the southern response policy has two sections to it. One is uh, we will pay the cost of rebuilding the house. Then the other section is called additional costs. And it talks about some other costs which might be incurred. And the difference might lie in those additional costs, which are only, Southern Response takes the view that they'll only pay them if and when they are incurred. Uh, and they are things like design fees, lawyers' fees, uh, demolition costs, and things of that nature. So I suspect that if you go and talk to Southern Response and ask them to explain it, that's, you'll find that that is where it's at. Uh, and that's why sometimes the amount that they'll pay, it's usually that the amount that they'll pay for you to buy a house elsewhere is less than the amount they'll pay for you to rebuild. Uh, because there's no design fees and often no demolition fees uh, in buying elsewhere. And the difference between rent and buying elsewhere cash settlement, shouldn't the cash settlement be something in the buying elsewhere? Well, look, come and have a chat to me later, because it sounds like there's a few details in there that I'd like to find out before I answer it fully. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. I know some of you still may have some questions, and as I mentioned at the start, if you have questions, uh, you can write them down and leave them with us. Or you can actually come and talk to any one of the panel here. We have other different agencies that you can talk to.